Hello and welcome. Another spectacular day on the House of Wellness. Sun is shining. Couldn't think of anywhere else in the world I'd love to be than right here alongside Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Welcome, guys. Hi, Good to see you, guys. So, you know, I have had something confirmed for me. I believe that what we have all been through over the last few years has made us all caring of each other and turns out it's true. <laughs> you are spot on, Joe, and a new study has proven it. Right around the world, humans everywhere help each other with small acts of kindness every two minutes. And we're way more likely to actually respond positively to a call for help than to reject it. And there's some incredible findings from these American researchers, a team that studied across five different continents, looking at everyday interactions between people who knew each other well and total strangers, looking at how often they helped out. Yes, Nick, people will respond to small requests for help seven times more often than they will decline them. It's nice. And I love a random act of kindness, Sergio. <laughs> I think it's a great thing. Changing gears slightly, but we often manage to stay connected, even when we're forced to stay apart. You think in recent times about Zoom, FaceTime, Teams, what would we have done without technology as a way to stay connected? It certainly saved us, didn't it, during the pandemic, and it continues to do so in the health sector, particularly when it comes to epilepsy. Yeah, around about a quarter of a million of Australians suffer from epilepsy, which causes recurrent mm. seizures. And it's the unpredictable nature of those seizures which makes life so challenging for them. Well, now a Melbourne young gun has helped develop a new app that will allow people with epilepsy to manage and monitor their seizures. It is an absolute game changer that could improve the quality of life for millions worldwide. Not knowing when a seizure might happen is difficult. The analogy that I use is that it's like having the stove on at home. It's just this level of awareness that you always have to have whenever you're out and about, whenever you're doing something that other people don't have to have. It's like this responsibility that is always with you. I have had to cancel travel plans in the past. I've had to cancel events in the past because um, you don't know when a seizure is going to happen. You don't know what week is going to be bad, what day is going to be bad, and um, it'll happen and it doesn't matter what's happening that day, that's the day you're going to have a seizure and you will have to cancel what's happening that day. For uncontrolled epilepsy sufferers like Gigi, unfortunately there's no crystal ball to reveal when seizures are going to occur. But new research from the University of Melbourne has resulted in the next best thing. We all know about circadian or daily rhythms that govern everything in our body from when we sleep and feel hungry and so on. And it turns out that we might also have these longer rhythms across many days and it is governing seizure risk in people with epilepsy. By analysing the brain activity, heart rates and seizure diaries of thousands of patients, biomedical engineer Dr Pip Caroli has found that seizures aren't so unpredictable after all. In fact, with enough information, they can be forecast just like the weather. We're really at the tip of the iceberg in understanding which factors affect these longer rhythms of people's seizures. The involvement of heart rate suggests there's some autonomic activation or stress that plays an important role, but many other factors from sleep to diet to hormones may also affect longer cycles. The main finding of our research into seizure cycles has been that they're very common for people with epilepsy of all ages, of all different types of epilepsy. However, they're very individual and, and specific to each person. So everyone will have a slightly different seizure cycle. So you really need personalised data to be able to build up a pattern of their seizures and generate a forecast for them. With this in mind, Pip has worked with medical technology company SEER to develop a life-changing new app. People with epilepsy use the app to input data about their seizures, other triggers and, and other kinds of data that all go into informing their future seizure risk. From there, they are able to visualise future days, hours or, or even periods up to weeks and months in advance when they're at higher and lower risk of seizures. Once I started putting in more seizures, I certainly started to see it linking up in terms of like, this is a bad four days or this is a bad five days and then that would be like kind of when I have a cluster of seizures and that's when I'll make sure I'm working from home so that if I have any seizures I'm at home and I can still do my work and um, be safe. So the 
Risk forecasting feature is currently enabled for around a thousand users all around the world. One of our users has a very strong 40 day cycle and he's had a 30 year journey trying to get treatment for his seizures. And in the end, being able to track his own seizure cycles in the app, he has said that has really helped him to feel like he's able to cope with it. And he told me the other day that he had looked at the app and used it to schedule a visit from his grandchildren. In future, I would love to see seizure risk forecasting be really integrated in how we manage epilepsy right from the diagnosis through to eventual treatment pathways. And I'm also quite sure that tracking seizure cycles and tracking cycles in epilepsy is just the start of how we understand longer term rhythms across a whole range of diseases and conditions. The more technology and the more research that we do to help people with epilepsy, which is a super common disorder, the better. And it's really exciting to have options and to have things that help people be in control of their lives like everyone else. Last year, Dr Pip Carolee received a prestigious science award from the Prime Minister for her outstanding contribution. Well done to her. And it's not only humans who are benefiting from this breakthrough technology, animals are as well. Well, Monday is World Environment Day, so let's take a moment to celebrate the recent developments in veterinary medicine, starting with penguins. That's right, we love penguins. I've got a great <laughs> penguin story for you. Recently in Singapore, a group of penguins underwent cataract surgery. They had artificial lenses put in to improve their vision. And as part of the group, there were three emperor penguins aged 20, and they're considered geriatric. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it, it is absolutely extraordinary, Jack, because we do intraocular lens implants in humans all the time, but not quite so often with penguins. <laughs> But the great news is these birds all recovered fully and it brings a whole new meaning to the phrase, a bird's eye view. Ah. And Nick, the work that modern zoos are doing now to protect and care for animals is actually quite extraordinary, very different from zoos in the past, which is a good thing. Absolutely. I love the meerkat enclosure at the Melbourne Zoo. They are so cute and they're so inquisitive and clever. I love a meerkat. And now meerkats have proven their intelligence by literally fronting up to the plate voluntarily to receive cutting edge treatment. Across our four zoos at Zoos Victoria, which is Hillsville Sanctuary, Werribee Open Range Zoo, Kyabram, Fauna Park and Melbourne Zoo, our staff carry out a range of procedures to monitor the health of the animals that they care for. So getting regular weights from them is really important and then also visual checks. So animals that have lots of feathers or a big furry coat, it's hard to see at a distance what is happening underneath of their body so it's important for us to get us nice and close. But even asking animals to open their mouths, so we can look at teeth, looking in their eyes, all of those are kind of general day-to-day -day checkups that we do. So vets might also ask for us to do some heart monitoring or some get some blood samples from them or even some x-rays which might be helpful as well. Well the reason that the voluntary healthcare program came about is because we know that getting that health information for our animals is important and we've always gathered that information. Our animal training programs are based on positive reinforcement. And what that means is that the keepers um, give the animal something that they want, which is normally a piece of food, in response to a behaviour that we want to see more of. So traditionally, if we were needed to get an X-ray from a meerkat, it would have required capturing them and taking them up to the hospital, where they would have been restrained and then given some anaesthetics so they were still for long enough so that we could get that X-ray. And as you can imagine, that's quite stressful. Stressful for the animal. There are some risks in being under anaesthetic as well and that therefore flows on to stressful for the keeping staff and also the, um, the vet staff. The benefits of our voluntary healthcare training program is now that we have animals approaching us to have their health checkups. And now that we know it's something in fact that the animals enjoy, we can do them more frequently so we are, are able to better monitor their health. We've got our rhinoceros and our giraffes that are actually happy to stand still so that we can get a blood sample from them. We've got our kangaroos that will approach us and stand still so we can listen to their heart. We've got the underdogs that 
people think are untrainable, so our giant tortoises and our koalas that come down and hop onto scales voluntarily. But my favourite story is a really simple one about an echidna called Sean. And Sean had lived at Hillsville Sanctuary for 30 years and traditionally the ways that we would get a weight from an echidna would be that we would need to catch them, pick them up, put them into a container that was on scales to get a weight. And um, if anyone has ever tried to approach a wild echidna, we know that when echidnas get a bit of a fright, they're actually really hard to pick up and quite spiky. So particularly Sean um, didn't enjoy this and decided that he didn't want to be around keepers. And so whenever keepers were in the space, Sean would disappear and just take himself off somewhere quiet. So he was away. Um, and that was just Sean's personality. Um, but what we decided was to give Sean a bit of a break and to see if we could teach him how to hop onto the scales. It took us six months to train Sean to come out and hop onto the scales. And now we see Sean walking around his exhibit when keepers are there, we're able to get regular weights. And for a guy that's been in our care for such a long time, it's such a simple thing that we can do that's greatly improved his life with us, which is a fabulous outcome. Well, we just heard about Sean the echidna there, but how about this one? A rare albino echidna has been discovered in the Bathurst region of New South Wales. Locals have nicknamed him Raffi, but so uncommon and rare as an albino echidna that authorities in that area are keeping the location secret because they don't want Raffi to be inundated with humans. Guys, I'm not sure how I'd go picking Raffi up. He looks a little spiky, but okay. when there are a lot of people around, echidnas can lose their scent trail. There was a sighting of an albino wallaby, also very rare, and the same wildlife group last year saw an albino kookaburra. Oh. It makes you realise just how precious our wildlife is and all those billions of animals that were horribly lost in the fires mm. in New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria. But thank goodness nature has a way of regenerating and now those animal numbers are picking up even in the worst hit areas. Nick, they tell me in Kangaroo Island, South Australia, the regeneration there has been nothing short of remarkable. And our celebration of nature and animals continues after the break. We tell you about how dogs are helping people with diabetes. Plus, we meet the puppy Picasso whose amazing paintings have to be seen to be believed. Dr Nick, we love our animals here at the House of Wellness, not just because they're cute and cuddly, but also because they help us live our best lives in so many ways. Well, especially the service dogs, Jack, because their heroic actions following those devastating earthquakes in Turkey and Syria last year, they were just remarkable. Yeah, we saw those pictures where people were being rescued days and days and days after the event, and now those dogs are being rewarded and they're getting a first-class reward. <laughs> yes, the National Airline of Turkey, in a show of gratitude, has given first-class seats to all those rescue dogs and so well-deserved. Oh, absolutely. A little closer to home, though, rescue dogs are helping in the health space. They're helping pick up red flags for people with diabetes. I was first diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of nine. It was a shock, uh, something we had to adjust to really quickly, but also something at that age that I was pretty determined not to let it change my life. And I wanted to live a fulfilling life, had lots of goals, dreams, sports I wanted to play, and diabetes was never gonna stop me. Eliza Bartlett promised herself that diabetes wouldn't hold her back. But at times, the stressful reality of living with the disease has caught up with her. There's 100, on average, 160 extra decisions we have to make each day. Just putting in that thought of what food I'm eating, what the weather is, uh, my exercise, stress, everything impacts your blood glucose from day to day. There's been times I haven't woken up in the morning, been found by my family who have tried to wake me up and I haven't come to. Luckily, I've been able to swallow, so I haven't needed third party assistance, but it's not easy. It's certainly not easy. As much as I say it won't stop me doing things, it's a, just an, another hurdle each day that I have to overcome. Thankfully, that daily hurdle just became much easier to clear thanks to the eager assistance of her new Labradoodle, Sal. Sal is the first pup to graduate from a new Diabetes Alert Dog training program provided by South Australian charity Australian Lions Hearing Dogs. 
So I've got a number of volunteers that have type 1 and they donate their saliva samples to me. So the dogs can pick up on the scent of a low or high blood glucose level. So changes in the blood glucose level they can smell and that's because the person releases certain chemicals that have a scent attached to them. Beginning their training at just 10 weeks old, after 14 months, these clever canines are provided to type 1 diabetics free of charge. As well as detecting the changes in their owner's blood glucose levels, the dogs are also trained to fetch emergency sugar supplies. When I first got Sal, she alerted me on day one for having a hypo, which was beyond what I expected. She has picked up on blood glucose levels before technology's telling me they're going low or before I'm feeling symptoms. Having a low blood glucose level can affect your thoughts or brain, even just a minor one for over 30. So being able to avoid even going into a hypoglycemia episode or a low blood glucose, you're certainly letting me get on with my day to day, helping my brain function at work or while playing sport. Uh, it's helping me a huge amount. So the dogs will do a number of other tasks that will assist the person with type 1 diabetes. The coolest task they do is the emergency button. So it's connected to a list of emergency contacts until someone picks up. It will prevent fatalities, it will save money on, in the healthcare system and also just limit the levels of mental distress that people feel from this condition. The program Australian Lions Hearing Dogs have begun is such an amazing thing that I don't even have words to express how thankful I am. She's there for me when I need her the most. She can feel things that no one around me can. It really helps with those mental health side of things of living with type 1 diabetes and certainly makes me not, not fear, not, the anxiety's gone and that gives me a friend that, that I think can genuinely save my life. Now, Joe Dennis, the blue staffy at home, always trying to sit next to me when I'm doing some work, but he's a chronic snorer, <laughs> so I have to kick him out uh, all the time. But pet-friendly workplaces are on the rise big time, and a lot of bosses actually using that as an incentive to keep their staff. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, they were with us 24-7 a few years ago, and now, you know, we're returning to work and the dogs and their owners are beginning to fret. And it does seem that workplaces have responded with the number of dog-friendly job ads doubling in the last two years. And Joe, interestingly, Australians surveyed recently, more than half of them suggested they'd be happy to take a pay cut to spend more time at home with their animals. Well, dogs are the best stress busters, and so it seems are smash rooms, which are popping up everywhere. We've heard about this before on the House of Wellness, where basically you pay money to go and smash stuff up to de-stress. Joe, I'm up for that. I wouldn't mind having a go. Well, Heisey has discovered one that's more splash than smash and it promises to leave a colourful and explosive trail of destruction. It's no secret that keeping active does wonders for our mental health. But sometimes, after a particularly stressful week, for me, a yoga class, a Pilates workout or even a strenuous gym session doesn't quite do the trick. Sometimes, to really let it all go, you have to unleash your inner child. Danny, I've heard of a smash room before, but I believe you've created the world's first splash room. What's the difference? Essentially, the, the splash room is very similar in the way that you sort of release your stress and frustration, but we wanted to sort of use that sort of platform to help discover balance by splashing paint around to create this sort of abstract art piece. And the whole point is to sort of create your art piece and let your emotion fly and splash it all out. How did you discover the benefits of destructive therapy yourself? Uh, look, it was more so just through, through, through the hardships that I went through growing up. Uh, my mum went through cancer. She sort of, uh, you know, she, she managed to beat it and, and, and that sort of provided that strength to sort of go, you know, there is ways to sort of, you know, get past these sort of traumatic times. And then, you know, we sort of uh, fell back into that same sort of darkness when um, my auntie sort of passed away due to cancer. So uh, me and my siblings, we were sort of just really frustrated, down and upset. And we had a lot of anger, but we didn't know what the anger was all about. So my sister actually sort of came up with the ideas, you know, like, just, just break something. Break something, break your emotions down. You know, let it out. That's the only way you can kind of release it because we tend to sort of just bottle it all up. And when we bottle it up, we actually do more damage to ourselves because we hold in all that grief. We hold in that emotion. Is it a solo activity or do people come in groups? Most of the time, people come in groups because they go, you know what, how fun is it to sort of, you know, just splatter the walls, but even more fun to splatter each other. You know, 
as we grow older, we sort of detach ourselves from our childhood. And, you know, we sort of form that sort of a routine of sort of just, you know, we go to work, we come home, we do, you know, our general duties. And we forget about what sort of experiencing fun is like. And it's something that we need to do to sort of, I guess, you know, reset, discover that balance between sort of you know, our work lives, our personal lives, um, our family, our friends. And that splash room is basically, you know, the moment. You're in there for the moment and you completely forget about everything and you just enjoy the session and you just, you know, create your own sort of artistic sort of area of uh, peace of mind. Oh, yeah. One thing that comes to mind was basically I walked into the room and after the session I go, guys, how was it? And I looked at the wall, there was no paint on the wall except paint all over themselves. So they were literally the walking art piece. And from that aspect I just knew they had a good time and they just sort of, you know, created a memory from themselves. Well, that was an experience. When I woke up today, I didn't feel like I was holding on to any particular stress or rage within my body. But then as soon as I started throwing that paint, something unleashed within me. And it felt like I was releasing tension that I'd been holding on to subconsciously. Now, right now I feel two things, adrenaline rushing through my body, but also tired because it is just like a workout. You get up a sweat, you release any tension, and you have a whole lot of fun doing it. Hi there, making quite a mess of it. But I tell you what, Dr Nick, his creations have got nothing on those of 10-year-old girl Ivy. Check out some of her work. Well, it's impressive, Jack. Um, I'd call it maybe simple surrealism or fur realism. Ah, uh, there's another dad <laughs> joke from you. Thank you. Yes, because Ivy is actually an Australian shepherd dog and her creations raise thousands of dollars for charity and she's based in the US. And it's also made her an instant hit on Instagram, amassing 22,000 followers. Well, from painting pooches to my first love, and that's the healing power of horses. That's up next on the House of Wellness. <laughs> Well, today, Jack, is all about animals, and I know you are a great animal lover, I as am I, and I often talk on the House of Wellness about Dennis, our beautiful blue Staffy, turns eight in a couple of months' time, uh, Dennis. A uh, big part of our family, the most loved uh, member, and we know the health benefits around animals and humans interacting together. Oh, we sure do. We've got two dogs, Harry and Hugo, a puppy and a 16-year-old Jack Russell, and I've got my horses as well, which are like the loves of my life. They are spectacular animals. Where did your love of horses come from? You know, I only got my first horse in my 30s. I thought, life is too short, I'm going to try it, and ever since then, I'm trying to collect them. But do you know what I love about horses so much? It doesn't matter what's going on in the world and how crazy your life is. When you're around horses, you can breathe, you relax, and you focus solely on the animal. It's really good for your soul. And I think horses, they really know what we're thinking before we actually think <laughs> it, I promise you. Which is why there's this remarkable program here in Melbourne with retired racehorses helping people in need. I think horses know something about us that we're never, ever going to be able to measure. I mean, we have lots of evidence that's been taken that horses can synchronise their heartbeat with us from five metres away. I mean, that in itself would, would show how uh, sensitive horses are to our body language. As a psychologist and equine therapist, Lisa Coffey is just as passionate about healing people as she is about healing horses. So if you just remember, they're herd animals, so they like to be with their friends. So we want them to be able to see each other as often as possible. Land gently. I think what's really special is that the horses are they're just non-judgmental and they will often respond to us how we respond to them. So it, it helps us to be calm, it helps us to express love, it helps us to express feelings. Yeah. Well actually like because you're like you're clamped like this. Yeah. Take a few really big out breaths for me. Lisa is the founder of Racing Hearts, an equine assisted therapy practice on the Mornington Peninsula, where retired racehorses are given a new lease on life and clients are offered a very different form of therapy. We have a team of mental health professionals, so we have psychologists, counsellors and psychotherapists, and they work with members of our community who might have mental health problems or dealing with stress. Instead of in a room-based setting where we have four walls, we work with our clients out here on the farm, working with our team of retired racehorses. I so you don't have to make a big circle. Good job. 
Biologically, we know that when people are in contact with animals, we have a natural release of endorphins. So we have those feel-good hormones and relaxation hormones like oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin. So what it means for our clients is that they are in a much more relaxed state when they're with the horses. And then the therapist can work with them in a therapeutic way because they feel more comfortable talking about their challenges. So you see how important those out-breaths are, those breathing exercises that we do? They're really good for helping your nervous system to slow down, just calm yourself down, and then in turn, that helps your horse calm as well. For this group of students from Mount Eliza Secondary College, a new racing hearts program is giving them an opportunity to not only learn about themselves, but develop new skills for their future. So the advantage that we have for the students here is that they're engaged in a Cert 2 in racing industry, which means we're teaching them how to work with racehorses and also they're locked into a 12-month mental health program with us, learning how to understand their emotions, regulate them and express them in healthier ways. Not only do they have healthier relationships with people in their lives, but from an employer's point of view, they'll be able to stay engaged in, empl in employment. All right, so remember, don't tease them, Brigitte, so just walk straight up to the bucket. Because if you're hanging around with the bucket, they'll come to you. I love working with horses. It just, it's improved my mental health and pretty much everyone in the program's mental health by heaps and heaps, you know, like we're all so much happier and so willing to come to class every day and work with these horses and just learn something new. I always feel really nice coming here and even when I feel down, um, I always end up springing back because something fun will happen and it's changed so much of my life. I'm so much calmer now <laughs> and I'm so much more excited to come to class and yeah, it's just an amazing program and I love it so much. Rain, hail or shine, they never fail to show up to the Racing Hearts program. And for children who've experienced trauma, equine-assisted therapy can have incredible outcomes. Some of the children that come here that have selective mutism start to talk to the horses. And from that then, the therapist can start to engage in conversations with the kids. I mean, I pinch myself sometimes when we actually see the changes in people and I have to really do well to try and hold it together when we're in session and the other therapists will say exactly the same thing. Whatever it is that the horses offer to us and whatever it is that the, the students and the clients can offer back to the horses, it just becomes a really, really special and therapeutic healing relationship. It sounds really scientific, but its role is really straightforward. It holds onto water really well and it's naturally found in our bodies where it's used as cushioning. As we get older, one of the main changes that happens is our body starts losing some of its function of holding onto water. So our skin starts losing a bit of that volume and plumpness and hyaluronic acid adds that back. L'Oreal Paris has a whole range of products with hyaluronic acid, their skincare, hair care, makeup, and all of this is scientifically proven to give back plumpness and hydration. Some of my topics are the Revitalift Filler Water Cream. This is a really lightweight, silky cream that's really hydrating. It's great for giving your skin back that youthful plumpness and hydration. The Revitalift Filler Serum, it's the number one selling serum in the world, and it's been scientifically proven to visibly reduce wrinkles by 47%. The True Match Nude Plumping Tinted Serum. It's like skincare meets makeup. It's got that smoothing and plumping like a serum, but it gives coverage like a foundation. For hair, I love the LV Hyaluron Plump Wonder Water. It's an intense conditioning treatment, and because of the unique way it's formulated, it can hydrate and plump hair in just eight seconds. I love digging into the science of beauty, just working out all the ways that can help us look, and more importantly, feel our best, because you are worth it. Well, in terms of health, Jack, I often think of dogs and horses, but it turns out there's a much smaller critter that's incredibly vital to human survival. It's bees, Darth. Of course, <laughs> they are pretty much responsible for every single food that we eat. And, you know, we talk about mindfulness here on the House of Wellness, and I love mindfully watching bees in the garden. It's so restful. <laughs> but, of course, they also produce honey, which is not only delicious, but along with other bee byproducts such as beeswax has been used in traditional remedies for centuries. But Dr Neat, the global bee population is under threat and moves are now underway here in Australia to protect our local bees from an overseas predator. 
the honeybee is the most important pollinator on the planet. So therefore, its impact on human survival is so great that we have to look after our honeybees. And if we look at our food security and food supply, one in three mouthfuls that we eat is attributed to honeybees, and 65% of agriculture is dependent on honeybees one way or another. Um, it, it's a not negotiable space. As a third generation beekeeper, Ian Kane knows bees are the secret workers behind our billion dollar food industry and reducing our carbon footprint. But a big name bloodsucker is looming on the horizon. Right now, a tiny parasite is threatening to wipe out our bee. The feared Varroa destructor could decimate local bee populations. Blood sucking parasite that brings with it disease and viruses. It's the last inhabited continent without Varroa mite, which has already destroyed bee populations around the world. The Varroa destructor is uh, a, a terrible little parasitic mite that breeds and lives in, in European bees. Um, so they hitch a ride on, on a bee and they, and they feed on that. But more importantly, when they get into a hive, they get into the larva as the, as the brood in the, in the beehive is being developed and they feed on the, the fluids and the, and the blood supply of, of that larva and, and weaken it to a point where it causes total destruction in a year or two years, depending on the level of infestation. Australia is the only populated continent without Varroa Destructor. With bee biosecurity a priority, enter the Purple Hive Project, an initiative from Bega and Bee Honey to preserve our ag industry from the damage Varroa Destructor has caused overseas. But they couldn't do it alone. To be honest, coming from an astrophysics background and no agriculture and honestly no uh, learned in university tech background. I had no idea about bees. But look, you can actually see the quality. You can see the yeah. tiny little fingers. Or... Joel and Vignesh are the brains behind the Purple Hive project. Yeah, we hadn't done much in rural agri-tech before, but we both were quite passionate about doing something in the Australian landscape, something to do with environment and taking what we learned in technology from the city and take it out to the country and just explore. And consistently, bees kept coming up and the need for bees, the need for bees, the need for bees. And so that's when we said, all right, well, we've got to start doing something that can combat the raw destructor without harsh chemicals that allow the beekeeper to not manually manage all of the hives and make it easier for them. Along with software giant Zalient, they developed a solar powered device to add to existing hives using 360 degree cameras to observe every bee entering the hive. Powerful AI algorithms catch any unwelcome guests. The way AI works is it's a bit like a child. And this is to really make it simple. You give a child a picture book with a thousand pictures of a zebra, and then you show it a horse and it'll say, oh, that's a weird looking zebra, but it kind of looks like a zebra. You then give it a picture book of a thousand zebras and a thousand horses. And it's kind of going to know that's a zebra because it's got the stripes and that's the shape. And although it kind of looks like a horse, it isn't a horse. That's it. That's the same for computer vision AI. We feed the model and train it with lots and lots of images of bees, lots of lots of images of mites, and it will then just continue learning. The concept is a simple one, although there is one problem. Australia doesn't have Varroa, so you know if we were going to do any testing, what do we do? How do we get that picture book? How do we get that picture book? So one of the first things that we did was um, we had 3D printed mites and we actually stuck them with nail polish on a bee and then actually uh, took pictures of that to just get an initial data set and actually train the AI and actually figure out how well are we going to be able to do this. And that came out pretty well. Yep. And then after that, we New had Zealand to send too. it to New Zealand and then actually because they have Varroa and yep. we don't, right? So the testing was done there. We got more data sets there. Yeah but we've, we've gotten it down to a point where I think we're pretty confident in, in what we're doing now. While still in the development stage, the bees also have an input, their attraction to the colour purple. Yeah, the shape was designed like a bee honeycomb and the purple as well. You know, bees are particularly drawn to it. They can see much better into the ultraviolet spectrum. And so this just allowed them to navigate home a lot better. It could be a game changer in the way we look at bees. And if you think, you know, in a 
production sense when we're in mid-season, there'd be 45 or more thousand bees in a beehive and in our business we manage 1,200 beehives, so you can do the maths on that. The greatest challenge here is we need to be going incredibly quick to photograph all these bees without any blurriness or distortion as they're flapping their wings to get into the hive. And so it's f dozens of frames per second. So it's essentially someone's looking at every single hive 24 seven for you. And then when something does come up, you get notified immediately. It's the food security for our nation and what that means. It means for our grandchildren, future generations, this project is in, incredibly important and that's where I, I'm, I'm so grateful. There you go. Well, since Heinze shot that story, Australia unfortunately has recorded its first incident of the virile mite and the Department of Primary Industries, as you would expect, have implemented some really strict quarantine measures to try and fight the threat. Researchers don't believe that the mite will impact our native bees, but it really does highlight the importance of the work of the Purple Hive Project. I've got real faith in the co-creators of the Purple Hive Project. They actually work with NASA on the Mars rover, so I'm sure our bees are in very good hands. <laughs> well, meantime, we can also help our native bees by planting what are called pollinator paradises, with plenty of the bees' favourite colour, which is, of course, purple. And there's no doubt that we need to feed the bees, Nick, that are responsible for helping to feed us as well. Up next, we serve up the dishes that are guaranteed to make our dogs drool on the House of Wellness. Stuffy nose is a familiar feeling for people with allergies. And while it's a constant struggle to avoid allergy triggers year round, trying to avoid a blocked nose in winter is almost impossible. Nasal congestion is uncomfortable and it occurs when the nose feels stuffed up from excess thickened mucus. So it can be caused by allergy triggers and the common cold, so it's ever more present this time of year. Fess Original Saline Nasal Spray is a natural, non-medicated way to help relieve nasal congestion. The solution is specially formulated to clear away allergy triggers like dust and pollen, and it also cleans and clears excess mucus from a blocked nose. Two out of five Australians are affected by allergies, including most people with medically diagnosed asthma. The National Asthma Council Australia's Sensitive Choice Programs helps people to manage their asthma and allergies. Through the Trusted Blue Butterfly, we identify products and services that are asthma and allergy aware. FESS Saline Nasal Spray has been Sensitive Choice approved. That means it's been independently and rigorously reviewed to offer a potential benefit to someone with asthma or allergies. A congested nose is really common, but it doesn't mean we need to live with it. FESS Saline Nasal Spray helps to relieve symptoms so we can breeze our way through winter without a stuffy nose. Well, Joe, I think one thing that's definitely improved in recent times is the care in the food that we give our animals and our dogs in particular. Remember the days where you literally put anything in the dog bowl and <laughs> expect them to be eaten? Oh, my gosh, I can't think of anything that smells worse than tinned dog food, Ooh. which my childhood dog, that's all he ate, right? Gross. <laughs> but, of course, our beautiful furry friends need as much nutrition as we do, whether it's fibre, carbs, protein and, of course, vitamins. And we hear that it's OK to feed our dogs things like carrots, uh, cooked eggs are OK for dogs, even blueberries, I understand, are quite good. And we've been told for a long while to stay away from giving them things like garlic and onions, grapes and chocolate as well, Joe. Yes, absolutely. And just like our own food, our knowledge around pet nutrition is constantly evolving. So here's Heinze and Zoe with some expert tips on the perfect poor course meal. Us Aussies love our animals, Zoe. You just have to check the stats. More than two thirds of us have pets, which includes <gasps> 5 million dogs, 4 million cats, 11 million fish, 6 million birds, 600,000 small mammals and 300,000 reptiles. Oh, my God. Do you know what? That is more pets than people. But it's no surprise, being a poor parent myself, it is so good for your health. Oh, absolutely. Obviously, there's that connection and companionship, but also increased opportunities for exercise and play. But, like us humans, diet plays a massive role in our pets' health. And that's why today we're dedicating our recipes to the furry friends in our life. Now, 
Ruby, Scarlet, my beautiful pussycats. Hello, hello. I know you're sitting on the couch. Come on, come on, girls. Off the couch, off the couch. Oh, um, huge hello to my two dogs, Chia and Kira, who are actually on the couch. Totally stay there, girls. It's your zone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually making my San Choy Bow Wow, which looks remarkably like the humankind, even down to the lettuce cups that we're going to serve it in. I'm taking a more traditional approach with my anti-inflammatory raw cookies. Now, I'm going to roll them together to form a doughy ball, but you can also flatten them out and use these gorgeous little animal-shaped cookie cutters. That is so cute. I love that you're still focusing on presentation, even when cooking for the colour blind. That is dedication. You know it. Now, what these recipes both have in common is good quality macronutrients, protein, healthy fats and slow-releasing carbohydrates. Gone is the kibble dinner. Many people are actually leaning into homemade pet food, but there's definitely pros and cons. Pros, control over quality and freshness and variety, plus also avoiding preservatives and fillers and some of those other nasty ingredients that can sometimes be in commercial pet food. Cons would definitely have to be time, expense and convenience, especially when you're travelling or leaving your pets in the hands of loved ones. But like our own diet, it's also important you look at the circumstances of your animal as well. Absolutely. And hey, a little bit of advice. Don't just pull any old cookbook off the shelf and assume that it'll be fine for your pet. Always consult your vet first. Mm, that is really good advice. But you know what? This Sanchoy Bow Wow, it, it actually looks better than some of the recipes you've made for me. Oh, don't take it personally. Remember, there's other things I don't do for you, such as <laughs> pick up your poop uh, or <laughs> rub your belly uh, or Aww. scratch uh, your back. Oh, go on, give it a go. Give it Ooh, a go. Get that leg going. <laughs> Taking holidays to me is generally one of life's great pleasures, but I think all of us pet owners are constantly thinking about how we look after our much-loved animals while we're away. Yeah, you know, there are loads of great kennels out there, but for some dogs, like our Labrador Princess Daisy, <laughs> that environment just isn't right for them. Plus, for the so-called grey nomads who spend their life on the road, finding someone to manage their pet while they leave the caravan for a couple of hours, well, it can be a bit tricky. Mm, I've got the answer to that. Oh, There's good. now an app for that. It's called Air Bark and bark, or bark <laughs> and it connects pet owners with responsible people who look after your pet for you. How cool. I love that. Check yeah. Air Bark and Bark and yeah. check that out <laughs> the next time. That's all we've got time for today. Of course you can check out myself and Gerald Quigley every Sunday on House of Wellness Radio. Thanks to Joe, thanks to Jack, thanks to Dr Nick Carr and thanks to Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next week.